Good morning. Let's talk about JavaScript. <laughs> In JavaScript, 4 plus 2 is 6. 4 minus 2 is 2. However, 4 minus the string 2 is 2. But 4 plus the string 2 is 42. <laughs> Let's talk about JavaScript. What is the truthiness of 1 and the string 1? Who thinks it's going to be true? Who thinks it's going to be false? It's true. What about the truthiness of 1 and the string 1 if we use not just two equal signs but three equal signs? Is it going to be true? Is it going to be false? It's false. What is the concatenation of two empty lists? It's an empty string. <laughs> what is the concatenation of an empty list and an empty object? It's the string object object. <laughs> what is the concatenation of an empty object and an empty list? Zero. <laughs> what is the concatenation of two empty objects? It's not a number. <laughs> what? Who here recognizes this WAT and this talk? Yes, this is a four minute talk from Gary Bernhard who goes through a whole bunch of WATs in JavaScript and Ruby. This isn't that talk. I have 25 minutes, so I'm gonna go through the why, not just the WAT. So let's talk about JavaScript. In JavaScript, the issue we encountered here is because we have various operators acting on different objects and depending what types those objects are, the operators work differently. So in the subtraction example, there's an implicit coercion happening where the string two is being cast into an integer or a number element, and thus subtraction works. But in the plus, there's an overloaded operator. That plus can be either concatenation or a sum, and in this case, it's doing a concatenation, which is unexpected. In this particular example, the double equals implies type coercion. The original double equals and equality in JavaScript would automatically change the type for you. Triple equals was added so it didn't do that, which is why that there's a second equality operator here. And in this particular example, it's a little bit complicated. Um, it's to do with this overloaded operand that I hand waved 30 seconds ago. But to describe exactly what's going on, we need to go to the specifications. ECMAScript, ECMA 262, ninth edition, ECMAScript 2018 language specification section 12.8.3, the edition operator, which has a wonderful little note right at the bottom of this section saying, note, the edition operator either performs string concatenation or numeric addition. The algorithm works as such. Consider two variables A and B. To, or, to work out whether you need to do concatenation or a sum, you need to work out what those values are, and then you need to work out which operation you want to do, and to do that, convert both A and B to primitives. To do this, the type of has to be one of the following values. A primitive in JavaScript is defined as undefined, null, a boolean, a number, or a string. To do that, try to take the value of that object, if not, cast it to a string. And if either A or B at the end of this operation are strings, then you concatenate them together. Otherwise, you have to cast them to a number and then add them together. So you can start to see where this issue comes into play. If we were to take one of these examples, which is the empty list and the empty object and apply this algorithm, we can see exactly where these errors start to occur. To start with, we need to convert our empty list to a primitive, which means we need to try the value of, which is itself. And the type of that is actually an object. In JavaScript, an empty list is an object. It's not actually a separate object type of list or array. If we, since we had that, we then have to cast it to a string to turn it into a primitive. And so if we cast an empty list to a string, we end up getting an empty list. This is based on the fact that lists of strings are, a, st a string is basically a list of different characters. So if you cast an empty list to a string, it'll just be an empty string. And the type of an empty string is a string, so we know what the right side, the left side of our equation is. Going through the same thing for the right hand side, convert it to a primitive, try the value of its an empty object again, but the type of that is object. But if we cast it to a string, we get object object. This is where it starts to get a little bit confusing until you realize that JavaScript is old, like older than some people in this room old. 
The stringy representation of an object in JavaScript is always going to be object object. If you've used Python or any other programming language, most of them have stringy, full, useful representations of their objects. If you cast the object to a string, it'll print out the contents of what that object represents. There is a function to do this in JavaScript, but it's not just casting it to the string. You can use json.stringify. Stringify is a real word. And then you can get the stringy representation of what your object is. So, we know that we can have the object object coming out when we do to string, and the type of that is a string. So then we have our two primitives. So then we can start working out what operation we want to do. And since at least one of those is a string, we're going to be concatenating those together. So what we end up getting is an empty list and an empty object. Adding them together is going to be object object. So if we go through our examples from earlier using our substitutions, we can see that the concatenation of two empty lists is, an em is, is two strings concatenated together, which is an empty string. The concatenation of an empty list and an empty object is the concatenation of the empty string and the string object object, which is object object. And then the other way around, object and empty list gets a little bit confusing because we've been doing this in the Google Chrome developer console and that is interpreted as an empty function block so it's ignored <laughs> which means we end up with a unary addition on an empty string which is zero <laughs> and then if we concatenate these two together we have the uh, empty code block again and then we have a unary addition on a string that starts with a bracket which is not a number. So we end up with empty string, object, object, zero, and nan. Ta da! <laughs> Except, so this is where Gary Bernhard's examples don't really pan out because what he was doing was using a developer console which had some implied stuff happening when you have that empty function, uh, the empty object which is implied to be an empty code block which ha then has interesting stuff. If we were to cast these two as variables and do the same operations, we end up getting something that makes a little bit more sense. We get the empty string which is fine, we get object object, but then if we have both A and B and B and A, they're the same, which is great because that's commutative. In mathematics it means it's the same forwards as backwards, which is really important because, you know, math. <laughs> so one might say that JavaScript is awful, but it's not. It's awful. It's full of awe. And I have an hour-long presentation with this exact title if you'd like to know more. But in essence, JavaScript is now a 23-year-old language that has to be 100% backwards compatible. There is no way to define what version of JavaScript you want to use, so every version has to be backwards compatible for itself. The Space Jam website still has JavaScript in it that still works today on modern browsers. And JavaScript won the browser language wars, defeating such formidable foes as Flash, Visual Basic, JScript, and ActiveScript. However, just because you don't understand the design constraints around a language doesn't mean that the language doesn't have value. So if you think that JavaScript is pretty awful, then just don't use it. There are so many other languages you can use in the browser, like, like JavaScript. <laughs> or you can use one of the 300 plus different languages that compile down into JavaScript. One of those listed up there is called Batavia. Ask me about it afterwards, I have stickers. But using a love, another language will not save you. Let's talk about Ruby. In Ruby, what is the truthiness of not true, double and false? Who thinks it's going to be true? Who thinks it's going to be false? It's true. What about the truthiness of not true and false? Who thinks it's going to be true? Who thinks it's going to be false? Aha, you see where I'm going here. There are no trick questions in this talk just design constraints and other factors that may make you go, what? <laughs> so in this particular example, the issue here is because that Ruby has double and and double pipe as and and not, and and or operators, but it also has the words and and or. And precedence wise, there is a not that sits between them in the order of operations. So sometimes they're not replaceable operands that you can, operations that you can use. So Make sure you stick to one set in your Ruby code. But enough about Ruby, let's talk about Python. 
In Python, if I have a variable A is 256 and a variable B is 256, is A B? True? False. It's true. If I have a variable A is 257 and a variable B is 257, is A B? True? False. It's false. But if I declare the variables on the same line and check, they are. <laughs> Let's talk about Python. <laughs> In Python, if you run Python in your terminal, you're probably going to be using CPython. An optimization of CPython is to create a list of integers in its cache for you. It goes from negative 5 to 256, which means that when we start declaring variables, it will use the cache where it can. For A, it uses the cache that already exists. For B, it uses the cache that already exists. So is is an identity check that t checks whether the two objects are the same physical object not whether their values are equal, whether they're the same object. So in this particular case, it's true. But if we declare variables that sit outside the cache, they end up getting created outside of our initial cache. And on separate lines, they get, uh, they, they get created outside of our original cache again. And so they're not the same object anymore. But if they're declared on the same line, the compiler can optimize this, store them in the same place, and so they are the same object. So to get around this, what you should be doing is if you want to do equality, actually use double equals. Is isn't that useful if you want to do equality. It does have its place. But if you want to do equality in Python, use double equals. Let's talk about Python 2. In Python 2, is 4 less than 2? No, it's not. So 4 is greater than 2, right? Yeah, this makes sense. This is math. Is 4 greater than the string 2? True. False. It's false. Is the string 4 greater than a list of only 2? True. False. <laughs> what about the string 4? Is it greater than a list of only 4? True. What about the string 4? It's then obviously going to be less than it, right? Yeah, of course. What about the number 4? It's false. What about the empty list of four and greater than four? Why exactly are we trying to do comparisons on these different object types anyway? <laughs> if we happen to do it in this particular order, where the number four less than a list with only four less than the string four, this is true. Why is this so? Let's go again to the specifications. Python 2.7.15 section 5.3 comparisons. Objects of different types are never compare equal. Such objects are ordered consistently but arbitrarily so that sorting a heterogeneous array yields a consistent result. This makes sense. The problem is the CPython implementation detail which states that objects of different types except numbers are ordered by the names of their types. So in this particular example, the types here are integer, list, and string. <coughs> H I J K L M N O P Q R S. So in this particular, in, in that, this, the reason is that the integer and the list and the string, and that's why it's in that order. Thing is, if you do the same thing in Python 3, you get a useful type error because you're not supposed to compare types of different. Uh, yeah, you're not supposed to com compare variables of different types, but it's okay because you have 312 days to upgrade. <laughs> Let's talk about Java. <laughs> if I have an integer a is 128 and an integer b is 128, is a less than or, greater or equal to b? Well, yes. So a is going to be greater than or equal to b, right? Yes. So therefore, a is going to be equal to b, right? The double equals when you deal with integers in Java is actually identity. Java has the same integer cache going on, which happens to be from negative 127 to 127, and we declared our integers as 128. You should be using dot equals if you're dealing with integers, but you could also use the primitive int type when you're dealing in Java. The two can be used in different ways, but one of them is a more, uh, a, a less primitive class has different operations that happen depending on which operands you use.
All languages have quirks. Everything I've talked about so far might be thought of as a quirk or a wat or, or some sort of foot gun or pothole. But if you understand how the language works, it's not a quirk, it's how the language works. Let's talk about Perl. <laughs> if A is equal to the, if the string A is equal to the string B, I want to print out true if, or else I want to print out false. So is string A equal to the string B? True? False. Double equals in Perl is numeric equality. So both A and B are being cast into numbers and then um, they're compared. Both those are cast into the number zero, so they're both equal. What you should be doing is using string equality in Perl if you want to compare strings. Let's talk about bash. In bash, what is four plus two? <laughs> terminal, it, it, is, it isn't a compiler, it's a terminal, so it doesn't actually do um, arithmetic out of the box, you actually have to tell it to. I've been hit by this one a few times. <laughs> Let's talk about Haskell. In Haskell, if I declare a variable A as 2 plus 2, A is going to be 4. If I declare a variable B as 2 plus 2 where 2 plus 2 equals 5, B is 5. <laughs> This is absolutely by design in Haskell, and this is a concept known as pattern matching. What it allows you to do in Haskell is to define exact things that can short circuit a function, which is really useful when you do want to do stuff such as uh, Fibonacci, where you can have it escape out early, which would be the exact same design principle you would use if you were to do the same thing in Python here. All we're doing is just escaping the function early based on the input we get. This can be really, really powerful in Haskell. It just takes a little bit of getting used to the fact that you can redefine the value of 2 plus 2. Let's talk about Pascal. <laughs> if I have a program where I declare a integer variable x and then I have this weird walrus character which ends up being a colon equals and then I try to increment that value and then I try to write out what that is. If I was to run this example, I would get the result true because Pascal is one of those wonderful languages where it has different operators for assignment and equality, which makes sense because equality in math is just one equals. And after you've been programming for a while, seeing one equals when you think you should be seeing double equals or triple equals, it's like, oh yeah, math. <laughs> Speaking of math, let's talk about Elixir. If I want to enumerate over a range of, ca of numbers one to five, and for each of those numbers, I want to have the square of the number, I end up getting 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, the first five square numbers. However, if I do the same function again but change the range from 6 to 10, I get dollar sign 1 ampersand capital QD. But if I was to do the same thing again, store the result in a variable and then enumerate over that variable and explicitly use the IO to print out the result, I get the numbers that I expect. We can start seeing exactly where this issue pops up if we use it at a explicitly different range. Instead of say, six to 10, say, let's choose two random numbers, say 65 to 90. We end up getting the alphabet. <laughs> this is because Elixir is based on Erlang, and Erlang dates back ages. And back in the old days, we used to represent strings as a list of integers that corresponded to their ASCII code. So 65 is capital A and 90 is capital Z. This is by design. There is a compiler optimization in Elixir that you can turn on saying, no, I actually want you to work like most modern languages, please. Thank you for being helpful, but please do what I say, not as I do. Let's talk about Scala. In Scala, if I was to print out the concatenation of braces and empty string, what would I get? Uh, it turns out in Scala, they actually have useful output when you print out an empty result. And the first time you see that, you think that there's a new object type turning up, but no, that's just what an empty result prints out in the uh, Scala terminal. First time you hit this, it's like, what's going on? But then when you understand what's going on, 
it turns from a what to a why. No language is better than any other language. The mere fact a programming language exists means that there's been years and years of work by many people building and developing a common dialect to describe and manipulate data in a realm in which it exists. Each have their strengths. Let's talk about PHP. In PHP, you can have ternary operators. Depending on the uh, truthiness of the left side of the question mark, we can either execute the left or right side of the colon. So if the statement is true, we end up printing true. If it's false, we end up printing false, okay? We can also start chaining things together. So if I wanted to print out false, otherwise one, false, otherwise two, three, who thinks this will print out one, two, three? It's three. If I changed it so it was false one, true, two, three, who thinks it'll be one, two, three? If I have it as true one, true, two, three, who thinks it'll be one, two, three? <laughs> Ternary expressions in PHP are left associative. It means that the strength of the ternary operation means that what we assume is that we will have true and then one statement and then another statement is actually having so much emphasis on the ternary operation that we have the result of the first ternary operation then denoting what we do on the second. Uh, PHPsadness.com says that you should avoid this altogether. <laughs> Let's talk about PowerShell. <laughs> In PowerShell, if I want to check whether 36 is greater than 42, print out true if it is, else print out false. Is this going to be true or false? False, right? So if I wanted to check whether 36 is then less than 42, is it going to print out true or false? <laughs> PowerShell is a compiler, PowerShell is an interpreter. It's a combination compiler and interpreter. So this is file redirection. <laughs> if we cut out the result of the file 42, it's the contents 36. <laughs> and yet, if we use the greater than, it appears like it's working, but it's actually not. What you should be using is avoiding using these two operators altogether and actually using comparison operators which are prepended with a hyphen. And it also means you don't have to remember which way the crocodile goes because it's like texty. <laughs> I've gone through a dozen programming languages and described in each what could be considered as a WAT. But if you have a deep understanding of how the language works, it's not a WAT, it's how the language works. So whenever you find yourself thinking what, turn it into a why, find out why things are the way they are. It'll help you get a deeper mastery of the language that you write in. And you might just learn something neat along the way because I've, most of these examples have been stuff that I've stumbled upon myself or I've researched or I've gone what and then went why instead. And if you're only proficient in Python, then that's great, you do that. But why not try your hand at another programming language? You might learn something along the way. You'll end up, at the end of the day, having a deeper and more complex understanding of how your language of choice works. Just learn something new. It's almost as though this is one of the axioms of the conference. <laughs> Thank you for your time. <laughs>